Good. So today we're uh, scheduled to start chapter 10. Chapter 10 is on alkyl halides and the reactions that they undergo and uh, their structure and properties. Uh, we already know, I think, what alkyl halides are. We've defined that. Uh, there are any number of related compounds, certainly our halogen, and here X can be any halogen, right? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Uh, but if that halogen is attached to a vinylic carbon, meaning that it's uh, a carbon that's involved in a, in a double bond or a carbon-carbon double bond, those we call vinylic halides. And by the way, we call carbons of that type vinylic, V-I-N-Y-L-I-C. So that's another type of alkyl. Uh, uh, that, that belongs in the same class of compounds, I would say, even though it's not quite an alkyl halide. Aromatic halides also exist. These can also be called aryl halides, A-R-Y-L. The two terms are interchangeable. And I really do have to throw in haloalkynes as well. I don't know if we're going to run into too many of those. They're not common. They're pretty reactive. But, you know, they do have a carbon-halogen bond. So I guess they do belong in this same category. So uh, all of these belong in the same general class of compounds of sort of uh, halogenated organic compounds, let's say. Um, uh, naming these things is pretty straightforward. If you can handle, you know, three methyl pentane, then you can surely handle three chloropentane. In fact, I think I've already put a little bit of nomenclature of alkyl halides on exams so far, because there's just, if you can name alkanes, there simply is nothing else you need to know in order to name alkyl halides. It's very straightforward. Uh, so I think that's all we need to say about that. Um, also, by way of sort of introductory information, uh, in terms of the nature of the carbon-halogen bond, one thing I think worth being aware of is that as the halogen gets larger, in other words, as we go from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine, I would say two things happen to the, to the carbon-halogen bond. First of all, that bond gets longer other things being equal. Makes sense, since fluorines are a really small, tiny atom, even as far as atoms go, whereas iodine is this big, fat one, right? So it's going to need more space in order to uh, form that bond. So the bonds get longer, other things being equal, as you, go, as you go down the periodic table in the halogens. And I would also say the bonds get more reactive as you go down the periodic table. So generally, uh, iodo, I, uh, iodoalkanes are the most reactive, other things being equal, and fluoroalkanes the least reactive. And we'll learn what some of the uh, reactions are, probably mainly next time. Uh, on Monday, I'm anticipating we'll talk about uh, organometallic reagents to some degree. Uh, and so it's actually one of the topics that was in my, uh, at least in a, in a broad sense, in my PhD thesis. I touched on, uh, some of my work touched on. Uh, um, organometallic reagents. So uh, hopefully you'll be in good hands for that. Uh, anyway, I think that's, that at least is getting us off to a good start. Uh, my main topic for today, I would say, is, um, I, I forgot to check, I've seen some of you, uh, 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 at least one student talking in chat. I assume you guys in chat can hear me. <laughs> he probably would have said something by now. He's moving his mouth, but I'm not hearing anything. So, uh, so are we all good in chat? Everything working? Uh oh. Oh, good. They are there. Good. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt your note taking and all that. Just wanted to make sure. Good. So, uh, probably my main topic for today is going to be uh, going back to chapter six, where we talked about uh, radical halogenation of alkanes. And this is relevant here in the chapter on alkyl halides because it's one of the ways that we can make alkyl halides. Uh, and I think I mentioned even back then that there were other complications that we were pretty much skipping over at that point, more or less anyway, that we would need to get back to. And that time is now. We're going to cover that uh, uh, important and rather subtle but still important complication here in Chapter 10. And then, time permitting, I would like to cover the whole issue of allylic systems, as they're called. We'll define that word. And your book doesn't emphasize this as much, but I also want to cover benzylic systems and define that term and talk about 
how it is that we can substitute hydrogens for bromines in particular in those two systems. And the reason I want to cover both of these is because allylic carbons and benzylic carbons have essentially the same reactivity. And so if, if you understand one of the two, then you understand the other. And it will just save us some time later on, I believe. Good. So uh, let me remind you about uh, radical halogenation. We already discussed that uh, you can take something like methane and treat it with, say, chlorine. We could just as easily have used bromine. And you can use light uh, as a radical initiator. I'm writing H nu as uh, a shorthand for a photon of light of the correct wavelength. Or you can initiate these with heat. Or you can use a radical initiator, such as a peroxide. There's all kinds of different organic peroxides and hydroperoxides that make very good radical initiators. And as you'll recall, we will get the substitution product, right? And we went over the mechanism of that uh, initiation, propagation, and termination. That's something that we've already covered. Uh, one issue, one complication that we have already covered is to point out that if we're not careful how we set up the reaction, it's very possible for the product to halogenate again. And so you wouldn't just get chloromethane, you'd also get dichloromethane. And in principle, that could keep going. You could have some of the dichloromethane get converted to chloroform and some of the chloroform converted to carbon tetrachloride. So in principle, unless we're careful how we set this up, we could get a huge mess in terms of a product mixture. And we pointed out that the way we prevent that from happening is by using a large excess of our alkane. So as long as you do that, as long as you have a large excess of methane, then the methane will always outnumber the, the uh, chloromethane molecules, and you don't need to worry. You can at least get only mono substitution products. So that's a point that we made back in chapter six, and that's important. And one could go on to consider something like ethane, C2H6. Uh, let's say we treated this one with, with uh, bromine. Again, assuming a large excess of the ethane. And uh, I'll just put ditto. You know, you can use either light or heat or a radical initiator in order to get that job done. There are even radical initiators other than peroxides, but probably peroxides are, pretty, are, are the most commonly used. Well, once again, our product would be bromoethane. And you would also get uh, the hydrogen halide as an inorganic side product. And I've also made another executive decision. I'm going to stop saying things like, the, the question will make it clear what you need to put and things like that. I, th I think you guys get the point by now. Probably by now I'm just annoying people by always saying those things. I feel like I need to at the beginning of Organic One until people get used to it, but I don't want to insult you guys. I want to treat you guys like adults. So things like the question will make it clear what you have to put, you have to do everything the question says, you don't have to do anything it doesn't say. I think you guys get the idea by now. I'm going to assume that if questions along those lines come up in your head, you'll hear my voice echoing in your head saying, if you do everything the question says, you don't have to do anything with you. Know. So I think you guys get the point by now. I, 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 just, I just really want to treat you like adults, and I don't want to insult or annoy people. Good. But um, the thing is, with both of these starting materials, like most of the ones we very carefully chose back in Chapter 6, there is only one possible monohalogenation product because all of the hydrogens on the starting material are the same. And it doesn't matter which of the hydrogens you substitute for a halogen. There's only one monohalogenation product possible. But what if that's not the case? What if multiple monohalogen pro monohalogenation products are possible? And even accounting for having an excess of the alkane, so that you only get monohalogenation products, what if there are multiple monohalogenation products possible? Uh, that, that's, when things, uh, that's when things get a little more interesting. And uh, let me see here. I actually, have the ac I actually have the experimental numbers in your class notes, so I want to make sure that I, uh, yes, I just want to make sure that I have them in front of me. Uh, let's see. So uh, maybe I'll start with propane. And let's say we treated this, doesn't matter if it's chlorine or bromine, let's treat it with uh, 
with chlorine. Well, in this case, I think you'll see, let's say we uh, um, photo initiate it. I think you'll see there's two different types of protons, two different types of hydrogens in this molecule. You've got the six that are in the methyl groups that are all the same as each other. And then you've got the two and the CH2 that are the same, but different from the six hydrogens in the methyl groups. So in principle, even if we use a large excess of propane, there's two possible products. One of them is, I'm gonna to switch to line angle drawings if I may. One of them is one bromopropane, and the other one is two bromopropane. How about chloro? How about we not do nuclear chemistry in our organic chemistry class? One chloropropane and two chloropropane. Those are the two products that we can get. And, uh, and in fact, we will get both of those products. Uh, in addition to HCl, of course. Those are going to be our two organic products. And there's no way to prevent that from happening. So again, the way we know that these six protons are one kind and that those two are another kind is, is, you, is you'll observe that if you replace any one of those six hydrogens with a chlorine, you'll get one chloropropane. That's, that's, what, that's how you know that those six hydrogens are equivalent in terms of this reaction. Meanwhile, you can replace either of those two protons with a chlorine, and you'll get two chloropropanes. And actually, this compound isn't even chiral. So we won't worry about uh, stereochemistry in general in cases like this. Uh, but um, but uh, at least roughly speaking. But, uh, but that's how we know that these are both possible, and they're the only products possible. And then I want to point out another subtle thing. This probably is the subtlest point, but it's going to be one of the main ones I hammer home, since it, it takes a bit of explanation to understand it, and, and a bit of following, you know, connecting the dots on your part as well. So I want to make sure that I explain this well. Let's say that in this reaction, only pure chance just random chance, random, by the way, in the original sense of the word, this is a pet peeve of mine, over the last 10, 15 years or so, the word random has changed meaning. So you, I randomly met George, you know, uh, and meaning it, it happened arbitrarily and unexpectedly. But the original meaning of random was uh, that only, only chance determined the outcome. So it meant something sort of mathematical. And that's how I mean random here. If nothing other than random chance determined the product ratio, what would you expect it to be? Well, there are six of this type of hydrogen that leads to this type of product. There's two of this type of hydrogen, which leads to that. So if nothing other than random chance determined the product outcome, our guess would be a six to two ratio or three to one or if you will, 75-25, you can put it either way. Uh, if only statistics or only random chance determined the outcome. Of the reaction. And what are, what, are, what are the actual experimental numbers if you actually ran that experiment? Well, I don't know, and I don't expect you to know either. But I do expect you to know that it will not be three to one. It will be something very different, and we'll cover why that is today. That's going to be kind of my capstone point on this lecture, at least. That's going to be my main point today. So again, what I'm, what I'm asking you to get so far is if, nothing, if your, your chlorine radical just picked a hydrogen at random, and I, again, by random, I mean the original meaning of random, such as like random numbers, that type of thing. If it just picked one of those eight hydrogens at random to go after, then we would expect a product ratio of three to one of those two species. And uh, so, so we can figure that out, but the, the main point also that I wanna make is whatever the actual experimental ratio is, and we'll do another example of this with actual experimental ratios, don't worry. But whatever the actual experimental ratio is here, it is not going to be three to one. It's gonna be very different from that. And we need to cover why that is. Uh, and I think, I think it's something that, although it requires a bit of explanation, 
I think it's something that's going to make some sense to us at this point in the term. Good. Well, let's move on to consider uh, but uh, butane. Since I happen to have in front of me the experimental numbers for butane, which again, I would never expect you to memorize or somehow pick out of thin air. I don't know what they are. Uh, I'm going to put X2 here because I'm going to consider both the chlorine and the bromine case. And let's say that we photo initiate it. We could just as easily put heat here or a, an organic peroxide or some other radical initiator. All of those will come out the same. I think you'll agree once again that, that two products are possible. Uh, and you'll get a chance to work with systems where more than two products are possible. Uh, and so one type, uh, let me actually change colors here. One type of hydrogen is the six that are in the methyl groups. Those are all the same. And another type is these four that are on the CH2s. They're all the same as each other, but they are different from the six protons on the methyl groups. So we would predict if, again, if nothing other than statistics, nothing other than random chance were involved, we could predict what the two products will be. But uh, let's first get their structures down. One of them is going to be uh, the one halo, that is one chloro or one bromobutane. Uh, maybe I will mark that. Well, this is probably not the best way to do it, but I guess it will work. I'll, I'll mark that uh, halogen in red to show that it replaced one of these six hydrogens over here, and then there is another product possible. Whoops. Thank goodness for control Z. And uh, that one will make that halogen in green. Good, so you've basically got the one halo and two halo products. Now, of course, this one here, that carbon is chiral, right? So. Technically, you would have both R and S, but we'll put that aside. I mean, in any case, we would expect that to be a racemic mixture, 50% R, 50% S. So let's just consider the, um, the connectivity at this point, just uh, the one halo compound and the one and the two halo compound. I think you'll agree those are the only two possibilities. And let's again ask the question, what would the product ratio be? What would we predict that would be? This is something I'm going to expect you to be able to do, not just with these compounds, but with any alkane. What would the expected ratio of products be if the only thing that determined the product ratio was random chance? If, well, I think you'll agree, it would be six to four, or three to two, if you will. You could put it either way. So if only statistics determined the outcome, we would predict that this would be three to two, or if you will, what would that turn out to be? 60-40, uh, right? You can write it either way. I don't care which way you do it. Uh, if only statistics ruled the day. In other words, if only random chance determined the outcome of the reaction. If there was nothing else governing which product you got, then random chance. We would expect to get that product ratio. Well, I happen to have the experimental ratios here. Uh, for chlorine, and again, I would never know this if I didn't have it in front of me, and I would not expect you to either. So I'll, I'll make it clear what it is I'm expecting of you in that regard, but it's not 60-40. It's 28 to 72. This is the experimental. In other words, if you actually ran this reaction in real life, that is the product ratio of those two compounds that you would get. And I have those numbers in my class notes. As well. I'm copying them straight out of my class notes, sorry to say. Maybe I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry, right? So again, I would never expect you to memorize or somehow guess what the actual experimental figures would be. But the point we're making here is, and I'll, I'll, I'll draw this together again, later on, but the point we're making here is whatever the experimental results actually are, they are not going to be what we would have predicted based on only statistics. So we'll get to that. Uh, with bromine, it's even more dramatic, and there are certain reasons for this. Uh, with bromine, it's actually 
I just want to make sure I'm doing this right. You have 2 to 98 of the 1 bromobutane to the 2 bromobutane, or the 2 2 bromobutanes. These are again the experimental results. And what I'd like to spend probably most of our remaining time today on is why that is, why the results are so different from what we would have predicted if nothing other than random chance determined the product ratio. And again, this is kind of a subtle point, but I think it's an important one. And it gives us uh, um, sort of a way of thinking about reactions that I think is going to apply in other cases as well. But, but it's, it's, I think, a, a useful topic to work your way to the end on and make sure that you understand what's going on here. So what can we conclude? Because since you would find something very different, or very similar, I should say, in terms of uh, um, experimental product ratios versus the ratios you would predict if only random chance governed the product ratio. You would find something like that that's very similar for any given alkane as the starting material. What you would find is that whatever the actual experimental product ratios are, those will not be at all like what you would predict if, if the only thing that determined the product was the number of, or the, only, or the product ratio was the number of each type of proton. In other words, if only random chance ruled that. So what does that mean? That means that something's going on here other than random chance. There's something else that's involved in terms of the product ratios. And that's what I would, uh, that's what I would like to uh, get into next. So let's, uh, basically, I, I just kind of want to re rewrite this. So what's going on here? How can we make sense of that? Well, in order to understand that, we need to understand the intermediates of this reaction. And we know what they are. We've already gone over mechanisms of this type. We know that there's an initiation step, and we know that there's a propagation step during which we'll get an organic radical, and then of course there's termination. But it's gonna be that organic radical that, uh, and the nature of that radical that answers this question for us. I think you're going to be able to, uh, I, I think it's going to be something that will be rather intuitive and that will make some sense. So let's ask the question, how is it that we get the one chlorobutane? Let's uh, focus on the propagation step. So in order to get the one chlorobutane, I think you'll agree, we need to get rid of one of these six equivalent hydrogens that are on the methyl groups. And I could have taken any of them. All six of those are equivalent. And again, the way you know that is, if you re is by naming the compound. If you replace any one of those six hydrogens with a chlorine, you'll get one chlorobutane. The name's the same in all cases. That's how you know that's one type of hydrogen. So remember how this works. We're going to generate a chlorine radical in our initiation step. That now is going to form a bond to hydrogen and leave behind an organic radical. So you'll get a molecule of HCl. Just to make things easier, I'll draw this radical like this. And then along is going to come a chlorine molecule, could have just as easily have been bromine. And we're going to take one of those electrons, two electrons in that bond, in order to form a new carbon-chlorine bond plus a new chlorine radical. Of course, you do get the HCl here also. That's just an organic side product. There's your HCl forming over there. And I think you'll agree that you will get the one chlorobutane plus, of course, another chlorine radical. And I think you remember how this goes. That chlorine radical is going to go find another butane molecule and on and on and on and on until we run out of the halogen. And then the reaction will terminate, just like we discussed in chapter six. So this is how you get the one chlorobutane. How do you get the two chlorobutane? Let's look at that propagation step. There we'll need to take one of this other type of hydrogen, these four that are equivalent on the, on the center carbon. It doesn't matter which. And yes, there is a stereochemical issue. You can get either R or S. Let's just put that aside for the moment and just consider uh, only regiochemistry, only connectivity. We're not considering uh, um, stereoisomers here. I mean, I guess we could. We could say instead of three to two, it would be three to one to one, right? But 
That, that's going to muddy the waters in this case. I don't think we really need to worry about that just now. Well, other than that, same thing. In our propagation step, our chlorine radical that we made in the initiation step is going to pull off a hydrogen atom. We're, we're going to stipulate one of these here and give, in this case, this radical. And then, just like before, our chlorine molecule is going to find that radical and generate our two chlorobutane, RRS. And of course, again, we'll make an HCl over here. We'll also, of course, make a new chlorine radical that's going to go find another alkane molecule. And round and around and around it goes until we run out of the halogen, and then the reaction will terminate. But either of these two things can happen. And I'm hoping you notice the difference. I'm hoping your eyes go right to that radical intermediate and appreciate their very different crit. Well, they're okay. As critters go, they're pretty similar, you know, but, but uh, they're, they're going to be very different in reactivity. This is a primary radical, and this is a secondary radical. And we've defined those terms, primary and secondary. Primary because there's two hydrogens in one alkyl group attached to this radical carbon, and secondary because there's two hydrogens and two alkyl groups attached to the radical carbon here. And we've made the point already that the order of stability of radicals is exactly the same as the order of stability for carbocations. The order of stability for radicals is exactly the same as for carbocations. For carbocations, we said the methyl carbocation is the least stable or most reactive, followed by primary, followed by secondary, followed by tertiary, which is the most stable. And it's exactly the same for radicals. Methyl radical is the least stable, primary radical is a little more stable, secondary a little more stable, tertiary a little more stable yet. And it's easy to see why. Radicals and carbocations are actually very similar species, right? We know that a carbocation is an sp2 hybridized carbon with an empty p orbital. So that's what a carbocation looks like. A radical looks almost exactly the same. It's again an sp2 hybridized carbon. We still have that p orbital here, except instead of that p orbital being empty, it contains one electron. So carbocations and radicals are, are very similar species in a lot of ways. They're both electron deficient. In both cases, the carbon is sp2 hybridized. And the only difference between the two is in the case of a carbocation, that unhybridized p orbital is empty. And in the case of a radical, that, that unhybridized p orbital has one electron in it. Both of them are electron deficient. So it makes sense that the more substituted the species is, whether radical or carbocation, the more stable it is. And so now we can come back to here and make some sense of this. No wonder we wind up getting less of the one chlorobutane than we predicted. We predicted 6040, we got 2872, which is exactly the opposite of what we would have predicted based just on random chance. No wonder there's less of this than we would have guessed uh, because the radical that it goes through is less stable than the other radical. So, uh, so and again, it's no wonder we get more two chlorobutane than one chlorobutane because the radical that goes through to give us the two chlorobutane is more stable than the primary radical that gives us the one chlorobutane. Now, I want to make sure you guys understand this. And again, it's kind of subtle. I am not saying that statistics doesn't matter. It's not an issue of statistics or radical stability. I don't want you thinking that statistics doesn't matter. Statistics does matter. It actually does matter that we have six of this kind of hydrogen versus four of this kind. That does matter. But radical stability or stability of the radical intermediate also matters. But the, in this 28 to 72 figure, the statistics is already baked in. That includes the effect of six of one type of hydrogen, four of the other. That's already baked into these results. And so the reason that the results differ so much from what we would have predicted if only uh, statistics governed the, the product outcome, the reason those two are so different is because of stability of the intermediate radical. So there's two effects going on here. Uh, uh, statistics does matter. And also, 
uh, stability of radical intermediate. That also matters. Both of those are in play. And again, I would never expect you to memorize or somehow speculate on what the actual experimental numbers are going to be in any given case. I'm not interested in you guys memorizing numbers. But what I would like you to be aware of, well, I would like you to be able to predict what the product ratio would be if only statistics governed the product ratio. That just has to do with the number of hydrogens of each type. But I would expect you to be able to do that even with an alkane you've never seen before. And then I would also expect you to be aware whatever that ratio is that you come up with, it is not going to be what the actual experimental product ratio is, not even close, most likely. And the reason for that is because the stability of the radical intermediate also matters. And so other things being equal, a secondary radical is going to be favored over primary and tertiary over both. So both of these effects are in play. And if you're ever actually given any experimental numbers, which they might do in, in OWL, uh, you'll notice that it's going to be very different from what you would have predicted, just based on nothing other than random chance, nothing other than statistics governing the product ratio. So it's kind of a subtle, a subtle point. And in my experience, it needs a lot of explanation. That's why I'm kind of leaning on it. I don't, I don't at all think it's beyond you guys to understand this. I'm confident you can get it. But I feel I need to lay it out pretty clearly, at least to the best of my ability. God knows I'm not the best teacher in the world. I never said I was. But I, I feel like I need to kind of lean on this and make sure that I do my very best to explain this in order to get the idea across. So bottom line, what I'm expecting out of you guys here that we're adding on to what we already knew about halogenation of alkanes is that, yes, we can make sure that at least we only get monohalogenation products by using a large excess of the alkane. That's clear. We covered that in chapter six. But what we're adding on to it, and again, this is all one way or another going to wind up in the YouTube video. So, uh, so you can make me say it as many times as you like. Uh, but um, uh, what we're adding on in addition to that is another level. We're also saying that even if you use a large excess of the alkane, unless we very carefully pick our starting material to be something with only one kind of hydrogen like methane or ethane or cyclopentane. Uh, but any other more complicated alkane, you've got multiple monohalogenation products possible, even if you use a large excess of the alkane. And it's possible for us to predict what the ratio of products would be. If there's two, three, or eight products we can predict what the ratio will be if only random chance determines the product outcome. And that's fairly easy to do. We just count the number of hydrogens of each type. And the way we know that we're looking at two hydrogens that are the same or two hydrogens that are different is by naming the product. And if the, the name comes out the same, then the two hydrogens in question are the same. If the name comes out different, then the two hydrogens in question are different. And maybe not always, but oftentimes in that consideration, we're not going to concern ourselves with stereochemistry. Uh, and so we can come up with these, uh, these product rate, these, these predicted product ratios if only statistics govern the outcome of the reaction. And the other thing I would like you to be aware of, in addition to be able to be, in addition to being able to come up with those uh, predicted product ratios if only random chance ruled the day is to be aware that whatever the actual experimental ratio is, which I, again, I would never ask you to memorize or speculate on, but whatever the actual experimental ratio is, it's going to be very different from what we would have predicted if only random chance governed the outcome. And the reason it's very different is because random chance is not the only thing that governs the product outcome, but stability of the radical intermediate also matters. And in order to understand that, you're going to need to understand, you're going to need to know what the order of radical stability is. It's just like the order of stability of carbocations. And no wonder more substituted radicals are more stable than less substituted ones, other things being equal, because both of these species, both carbocations and radicals, are electron deficient species. 
And so the more electron density you can pack around the radical or carbocation carbon by virtue of having alkyl groups instead of hydrogens, the more you can do that, the more you're going to stabilize that electron deficient carbon. So no wonder the order of stability is the same for both. So that's basically it. Uh, Owl will certainly give you some ideas as to how to practice this, but expect to be given alkanes you've never seen before, come up with what you think the product ratio would be if only statistics governed the outcome, and then be aware that whatever the actual uh, product ratio is, it will not be what you just predicted if only statistics governed the product ratio because statistics isn't the only thing that determines the product ratio. Stability of the radical intermediate is. And I would expect you to be able to come up with what the different possible radical intermediates are in the, that we form in the propagation step. And then, of course, which is, going to be, which is going to be more or less stable than the other. But that's basically it. Like I said, this was going to be my main point for today. I also do want to consider uh, the allylic and benzylic systems, since if we cover one, we might as well cover the other. Since if you understand allylic systems, you automatically get benzylic systems thrown in for free. So that's basically it. Uh, and, and then we'll end probably on that topic, I think. That's good enough for today. Good, so that's kind of a lot to chew on. Uh, hopefully I've at least given you a good starting point for starting to practice all this on your own, but I, I wanted to make sure that I let us through that since it is kind of subtle. Everyone at least clear on uh, a starting point for this stuff. Do radicals undergo one, two hydride shifts like uh, carbocations? Good question, answer is no because uh, you're very seldom, if ever, going to find, uh, everyone see the question in chat, you're very seldom, if ever, going to find uh, reactions in which, uh, that are both uh, homolytic and heterolytic. So I'm not aware of anything like that. I don't think radicals will rearrange like carbocations will. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not aware of any situations in which they do. So in any case, the one word answer to your question is no, not to my knowledge. I don't think they undergo shifts like that. Good, uh, that's fine. So let me then clear us out again. And uh, let's consider uh, uh, these allylic and benzylic systems. And the reason we're gonna do that is we're still gonna be talking about radical reactions. I'm gonna introduce another type of uh, radical reaction uh, that also generates alkyl halides. Good. So as we've pointed out already, uh, the term vinylic refers to uh, carbons that are involved in a carbon-carbon pi bond, and it does have to be a carbon-carbon pi bond. So this over here will be a vinylic carbon. And anything attached to it, whether hydrogen or otherwise, will be also vinylic. You can say that this is a vinylic hydrogen. The term allylic, a-L-L-Y-L-I-C refers to next door to vinyl, one position over. So we call that an allylic carbon, A-L-L-Y-L-I-C. So anything that's one carbon away from a vinylic position is going to be an allylic position. And anything attached to such a carbon will be an allylic, whatever that is. So this would be an allylic hydrogen. And yes, you could keep going. There is homoallylic, and I don't think we're ever going to need to worry about that. But uh, it turns out that allylic positions are special in terms of their reactivity. And this is something we're going to, again, run into multiple times, I'm sure, as the, as the course goes on, both this term and next term. Likewise, uh, I think you already know what an aromatic carbon is, or aryl, and you understand that an aromatic hydrogen is one that is attached to such a carbon, and we could talk about an, you know, an aromatic chlorine or whatever. You know. But the aromatic position is in the benzene ring. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you how much I regret this, except you know, none of us was around when these names were decided on, and so we, we weren't there to complain. But Unfortunately, the term benzylic, 
B-E-N-Z-Y-L-I-C, refers to carbons not in an aromatic ring, but one position over, attached directly to an aromatic ring. It's very unfortunate. It's confusing because benzylic sounds like it should be mean the same thing as aromatic. It does not. Benzylic means next door to an aromatic ring. And the hydrogen attached to such a carbon would be a benzylic hydrogen. It's very unfortunate. It's a confusing term. So please be sure that you get it down. I'll give you an example. Uh, if you would, I think you already know that a compound like this would be called bromobenzene. But if you put a CH3 in between, or CH2 rather, that compound is called benzyl bromide. It's unfortunate, but we're stuck with it. This decision was made long ago, probably 100 plus years ago. So just something to be aware of. You could do the same thing with alcohols. You probably know that a benzene ring with an OH on it is called phenol, P-H-E-N-O-L. We'll get to that next semester also when we discuss nomenclature of aromatic compounds in more detail. Benzyl alcohol would be just like benzyl bromide, benzene ring CH2OH. And again, benzyl alcohol sounds like the OH should be on the benzene ring, but it's not. That's phenol. See, so it's, it's confusing. But the reason that I'm bringing up both of these types of systems at the same time is because they have essentially the same reactivity. And I think I'm going to have to, uh, I think I'm going to have to say more about this starting the next time, but we can easily replace either allylic hydrogens or benzylic hydrogens with bromines. There's a reagent that will do that for us. And that reagent is known as n bromosuccinamide with the capital N meaning that the bromine involved is a succinimid, is attached to the nitrogen. And maybe in order to understand that name, uh, since I have a couple minutes here, I think I can make this make sense. Uh, there's actually a rather logical progression here. Uh, that compound, I, I don't know if I care that you memorize the name. I'm just trying to show you where it comes from. That compound is one of several dicarboxylic acids, which we'll have more to say on, I think, next term. That compound happens to be called succinic acid. Uh, and succinimid looks like this. You've just uh, made kind of like a double amide by replacing, uh, by closing the ring and forming uh, and, and adding that nitrogen in between. That guy is called succinimid. And again, memorizing these names, that's not my point here. But n succinimid. is simply what we get if we replace that hydrogen with a bromine. So uh, we also call this lovingly NBS, or n bromosuccinamide And n bromosuccinamide is the reagent of choice for converting allylic or benzylic hydrogens, converting allylic or benzylic CH bonds to carbon bromine bonds. And maybe we'll start with some examples of that allylic or benzylic carbon hydrogens to carbon bromine bonds. And so you just uh, dissolve up your uh, allylic or benzylic species uh, in some appropriately unreactive solvent, and you add NBS and uh, a radical initiator or light or heat, and you will convert the carbon hydrogen bond to a carbon bromine bond. The reaction is, again, or is very much like the radical halogenation reaction. So maybe we'll start with some examples of that on Monday since I'm out of time. But, uh, but uh, do be careful with this term benzylic. It's unfortunately very confusing. So other than that, have a great weekend. I will see you all on Monday. If you wish to pick up exam one and or exam two in your way out, please do so. Have a great weekend.